Well guys, here we finally are, the final part of the Ned Kelly series on my channel. When I started it, I never really expected it would need a third part, but there is just so much to this man's life, and I feel it would be a disservice to have cut out a lot of it. If you haven't seen the two previous parts, I highly recommend you check those out before watching this one. I'll put a link to both those parts in the description, and will also put cards up now. But, with all that being said, let's get into the video. During the Kelly outbreak, and after the Geraldry raid, police watch parties began monitoring houses belonging to relatives of the gang in hopes of acquiring more information, or even catching some of the Kelly gang members themselves. The police primarily used the house of Joe Byrne's mother's neighbour, Aaron Sherritt, a former Greta member and a lifelong friend of Joe Byrne, as a base of operations. On top of this, Sherritt also accepted police payments for camping with the watch parties, and for providing information on the Bush Rangers' activities, although it is likely that he gave the police some false information in order to protect his friend Byrne. In March 1879, Byrne's mother discovered Sherritt with a police surveillance group and later denounced him as a spy. In the following months, Byrne and Ned sent Sherritt messages stating that the Lloyds and Quinns wanted him shot and that it would be better for him if he joined the Outlaws perhaps in the hope that their friend would see the error of his ways and return to them. However, he would not, and after continuing his relationship with the police, Joe Byrne warned Sherritt's mother that the outlaws were going to kill him. Soon after, the gang finally decided that they would murder Sherritt as a part of their own plan, one that they boasted would astonish not only the Australian colonies, but the whole world. On the 26th of June, 1880, Dan and Byrne rode into the Woolshed Valley, and kidnapped Anton Wick, who lived near Sherritt, before forcing him to come with them to Sherritt's hut, which was occupied by Sherritt, his pregnant wife Ellen and her mother, as well as four policemen who had been stationed in the hut to guard Sherritt and spy on Byrne's mother's home. At about 6.30pm, under the cover of darkness, Dan went to the front door of the hut, while Byrne forced Wick to knock on the back door and call out for Sherritt. When Sherritt answered the door, Byrne subsequently shot him in the throat and chest with a shotgun, killing him. Byrne then entered the hut, letting Dan in, while the four policemen hid in the bedroom. Byrne then heard the police scrambling for their shotguns and demanded that they come out. When the police didn't respond, he fired into the bedroom before sending the pregnant, now widowed, Ellen into the bedroom to bring out the police. But unfortunately for Byrne, the police held her in the room. The outlaws then left the hut, whilst loudly threatening to burn those inside alive. After a failed attempt to set fire to the building, the outlaws stayed outside, yelling threats at the occupants before releasing a wick and riding away after the two hour long siege. The terrified policemen didn't end up leaving the hut until the following morning however, for fear that the bush rangers would still be waiting outside for them. Now that the policemen were free, the gang estimated that the news of Sherrod's murder would reach Beechworth by early Sunday morning, prompting a special police train to be sent up from Melbourne. They also managed to predict that the train would collect reinforcements in Benella before continuing through Glenrowan, a small town in the Warby Ranges. There, the gang planned to pull off their biggest hit against the police yet, by derailing the train and shooting dead any survivors, when they would then ride to an unpoliced Benella and subsequently rob the banks, set fire to the courthouse, blow up the police barracks, release anyone imprisoned in the jail, and generally play havoc with the entire town, before returning to the relative safety of the bush. In order to derail the train, Ned and Hart tried but failed to damage the track at Glenrowan, but being unable to do so, forced two local plate layers and some labourers camped nearby to finish the job. The outlaws didn't merely pick any spot on the track, however. They specifically chose a line that ran across a deep ravine, and told their captives that they were going to send the train and its occupants to hell. After the train track was successfully damaged, Byrne and Dan arrived at Glenrowan, and with the help of the other gang members, took over the railway station, the station masters, and Ann Jones' homes, as well as the Glenrowan Inn. The gang used the hotel to hold the workers and any other male prisoners they gathered throughout the night and the following day. However, most of the women and children taken prisoner were held at the station master's home, the other hotel in town, McDonald's Railway Hotel, located on the opposite side of the tracks, was used to stable the gang's stolen horses, one of which carried a tin of blasting powder and fuses. 
The pack horses also carried suits of the famous bullet repelling armour the gang would come to be known for, complete with a helmet and weighing about 44 kilos in total. The armour was specifically designed to provide protection as the outlaws stood on top of the embankment firing down on any survivors of the train wreck. It is noteworthy that there was no leg armour as would hinder the outlaws movement and wasn't necessary given the angle of any return fire up the embankment. By Sunday afternoon, the expected train had still not arrived, so the outlaws moved most of the women and children to the Glen Rowan Inn, where there were now 62 hostages, including sympathisers, who the gang had planted to help control the situation. As the hours continued to pass without any sight of the train, the gang provided the hostages with alcohol and organised music, singing, dancing, and games. One hostage would later say that Ned did not treat us badly, not at all. In saying that though, during this time, Ned did threaten to shoot another young hostage, keeping the boy in a state of extreme terror for about half an hour. During the late afternoon and evening of Sunday, Ned allowed 21 of the hostages, who he considered trustworthy, to leave. At about 10pm, Ned and Byrne captured Glen Rowan's lone constable, Hugh Bracken, with the assistance of hostage Thomas Kerno, a local schoolmaster who sought to gain the gang's trust in order to thwart their plans. Sometime after this, believing that Kerno was a genuine sympathiser, Ned let him and his wife return to their home close to the railway tracks, but warned them to go quietly to bed and not to dream too loud. It would turn out that the train Ned had been expecting hours earlier would only leave Benella at 2am on Monday. The train carried seven regular troopers under Superintendent Hare, five Queensland Aboriginal troopers under Sub-Inspector O'Connor, four journalists, and several other civilians. Acting on intelligence that the tracks had been sabotaged, Hare had ordered a pilot engine to travel ahead of the police train. At 2.30am, the pilot train was finally approaching Glen Rowan when Kerno went to the tracks, signaled it to stop, and alerted the driver of the danger. Elsewhere, Kelly had decided it was time to let the hostages return home, and was delivering them one final lecture about police informers when Byrne came in from outside with the news that a train had arrived. The outlaws then donned their armour and prepared themselves for a confrontation. Meanwhile, Constable Bracken told the hostages to lie low and escaped to the railway station to explain the situation to the police. Upon hearing Bracken's report, Hare immediately led a detachment of police towards the hotel while the main body of troopers prepared horses and equipment just after 3am. In preparation for the attack, the four outlaws positioned themselves in the shadow of the veranda in the front of the hotel and began firing when the police were about 30 metres away in the moonlight. The police subsequently returned fire and about 100 to 150 shots were fired in 15 minutes. During the intense firing, someone shouted that there were women and children in the building and there was a lull in the shooting. During the exchange of gunfire, Superintendent Hare was wounded in the left wrist and soon had to return to Benella for treatment. Ned was also wounded in the left hand and arm, as well as his right foot. Byrne, as well, was shot in the leg and retreated into the hotel. Two innocent hostages were also fatally wounded by the police fire through the thin weatherboard walls of the building, one of them being 13-year-old John Jones and the other a railway worker named Martin Cherry. A third hostage, George Metcalf, was also fatally wounded either by the police fire or by accidentally being shot by Ned in an earlier in incident. During this lull in the firing, a number of hostages, mostly women and children, fortunately managed to escape from the hotel. At this point, Kelly was bleeding heavily from his wounds and retreated behind the hotel and made his way into the bush, where police found his skull cap and rifle at around 3.30am, about 90 metres from the hotel. Kelly later stated that at the time he was in the bushes and not far from the police. The police would surround the hotel throughout the night after the gang retreated and the firing continued intermittently. At about 5am, Joe Byrne was fatally shot in the groin while making a toast to the Kelly gang in the bar. Shortly after this, between 5.30 and 7am, police reinforcements under Sergeant Steele and Superintendent Sadler arrived from Wangaratta and Benella bringing the total number of police present to about 40. Seriously wounded, yet still not found, Kelly laid in the bush for most of the night before, at 7am, dressed in his armour and armed with three handguns, he emerged from the bush and attacked the police from the rear. 
Eyewitnesses variously compared the figure moving in the early morning mist to a bunyip, the devil, or a ghost. He was no ghost, however, and police returned fire as Kelly moved towards the hotel, now staggering from his injuries, combined with the weight of his armour and the impact of bullets on the plate iron, which he later described as like blows from a man's fist. Kelly continued firing, however, even through the difficulty and pain of aiming, firing, and reloading his weapons due to his injuries and limited vision through his helmet. The gun battle with Ned lasted under half an hour until Steele brought him down with two shotgun blasts to his unprotected legs and thighs. Ned was then disarmed and carried to the railway station where a doctor attended to his injuries. He was later found to have more than 28 wounds, including serious gunshot wounds to his left elbow and right foot. In the meantime, the siege continued, with Ned's brother Dan and Steve Hart still inside. At around 10am, a ceasefire was called, and the remaining 30 hostages left the hotel. By Monday afternoon, a crowd of some 600 spectators had gathered at Glen Rowan, and Dan and Hart had ceased shooting. Unwilling to allow his men to storm the hotel, a saddler ordered a cannon to be sent to blast out the outlaws, but then decided to burn them out. At 2.50pm, Senior Constable Charles Johnson, supported by covering fire from the police, set fire to the Glen Rowan Inn. Matthew Givney, a Catholic priest, entered the burning building sometime after in an attempt to rescue anyone inside, and, and discovered the bodies of Byrne, Dan, and Hart. The exact manner of Dan and Hart's deaths are unknown, however it seems they likely committed suicide together in order to avoid burning alive. Sadly, Dan Kelly had just turned 19 at the time, and Steve Hart was 21. This brought the ultimate death toll of the siege to three members of the Kelly gang, and three hostages, with Ned being the only Kelly gang member to survive the siege. Ned Kelly, after adequately recovering, stood trial on the 19th of October 1880 in Melbourne before Sir Redmond Barry, the same judge who had earlier sentenced his mother to three years hard labour. The trial would eventually be adjourned to the 28th of October, where Kelly was convicted of the willful murder of Constable Lonigan and sentenced to death by hanging. The judge concluded with the customary words, May God have mercy on your soul, to which Kelly replied, I will go a little further than that, and say I will see you there where I go. Somewhat creepily, Barry died of natural causes only 12 days after Kelly's execution. Speaking of which, would be carried out on the 11th of November, after an unsuccessful petition for clemency containing some 32,000 signatures was presented to the governor's private secretary on the 8th of November. The day before his execution, Kelly had his photographic portrait taken as a keepsake for his family, and he was granted farewell interviews with relatives. One newspaper reported that his mother's last words to him were, Mind you die like a Kelly. The following morning, John Casto, the governor of the jail, informed Kelly that the hour of execution had been fixed at 10am. Kelly's leg irons were soon removed, and at 9am he was let out by warders, accompanied by chaplain Dean Donaghy. When passing the jail's garden, he commented on the beauty of the flowers. Soon after this, Kelly was taken to the gallows and hanged. Accounts differ about his last words, with some newspapers reporting they were such is life, while other newspapers wrote that they were, ah well, I suppose it has come to this, as the rope was placed around his neck. The actual warden, though, later wrote that Kelly, when prompted to say his, his last words, mumbled something indiscernible. Regardless of his last words, though, he was now dead, and thus ending the incredible story of his life. Well, that's where this entire series is going to end. If you've watched all three parts, thank you so much. I know they haven't been the most popular videos on my channel, but hey, who really cares? I enjoyed making them. If you enjoyed watching them, please don't forget to leave a like and subscribe if you'd like to see more videos from me. But with that being said, and as always, I hope you guys have a great day, night, wherever you are, and I hope to see you in the next one.